Well, good morning, everybody. Can everybody say thank you to Creighton? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful man of God as we uh, spent the weekend together with the rest of the brothers at the retreat. And, um, you know, I've kind of been in a very reflective mood so far. Now, I think it's because, you know, just coming off of the retreat and just having a wonderful time just resting there and, and being with everybody and, you know, the scripture or the foundation scripture for the entire weekend was, of course, Proverbs 27, 17. And that was one of the passages of scripture that I grew up on. And uh, so what I shared at the retreat was, um, am I online yet? Maddie? What I shared at the retreat um, was how to be a sharp man. And I'm, I'm kind of get into that. And um, I just saw how it tied in uh, pretty wonderfully from, you know, what I talked about this past Saturday and um, what I'm going to talk about today. But uh, sorry, technical difficulties. I'm going to try and kind of work off of my iPhone right now <laughs> because I noticed that my iPad was getting a little bit slow. So let's try this. Okay, perfect. So bear with me. Thank you, thank you. Okay, there we go. So um, yeah, I've been in a reflective mood, just kind of thinking about certain things and really just being thankful about what we have here in Hala'iwa. And um, you know, one of the things we talked about, you know, as men was, you know, we're not about the hype or anything like that, but really looking at ourselves and really examining ourselves for the sake of our families, for the sake of our spouses, for the sake of our children, for the sake of our communities, amen? Because if you guys know us, and I know that you guys know us for, for quite some time now and how we feel about the community and going out there and really living for the cause of Christ, but it really begins with our family units, amen? It really begins at home. And I remember sharing, it was at my Truth Project class. Um, it was interesting because some of the brothers out in Mililani, they said, hey, you know, Pastor Glenn, and you know, one of them shared, and he was saying about how, um, and he was complimenting me, and I don't mean to, you know, sound like I'm talking about myself, but, you know, he's just, he was just saying, you know, Pastor Glenn, what did you guys do, you know, to raise such wonderful children? And I said, well, first of all, we're not perfect. I hope you guys know that, and, um, but it, was, it really points back to the Shema. You know, when talking about, um, you know, passing your faith on to the next generation and, and teaching them to do the same thing, and it's a process of duplication, and just passing your faith on and passing your faith on, and that's really what we chose to focus on. And so it, it was really quite the same, and, and, and so, you know, when I told them that we tried, you know, putting together a youth group here in Haleiwa, but that just doesn't seem to be our DNA, amen? Because mothers and fathers, husbands and wives are not understanding on a more deeper level that they, first and foremost, are in a sense, their children's pastors. Can I get an amen? And so I was just kind of thinking about that and I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, we never made that up. You know, there's no biblical basis for youth ministries, but we do understand the importance of ministry. So we're not trying to downplay that at all. We understand the importance of it. We understand the significance of it. But really what we believe, of course, is that the parents are the spiritual leaders of their children. And that's how God designed it. And that's what we choose to stand on. Amen. And so just kind of reflecting on those things and being with the brothers this weekend. And, and I just wanted to say, you know, as you, um, you know, saw some of the pictures on screen, we had a wonderful time. And I know that some of you brothers, you know, work during the weekends and you guys couldn't get off and different things like that. But I, I just want to encourage you with all the love of my heart, um, you know, to make it a point to be there next year. You know, you'd be there next year. We'll be leaving that. Because um, it's just a wonderful time, a wonderful time of just being able to take everything off, and we're not saying that we're going to strip you naked. <laughs> we're not saying that, you know, figuratively, of course, right? Not literally. But figuratively, you know, a lot of the brothers have expressed some concern about, you know, sometimes it's a little difficult, you know, to get around the other brothers and, um, you know, kind of just bear it all, if you will. And no pressure. We're not, we're not doing that. You know, we're not, we're not about that. 
Um, you're, you're, you can open up as much as you want to open up. But really, it's, it's something when you get around the brothers and really ironing, sharpening iron. You know, and just knowing that it's a very safe environment. I think one of the, one of the key words this morning when I was talking with the brothers is that it's, it's really a safe place. It really is. Because, you know, we, we acknowledge um, that we're not perfect and we come to the realization that we need each other. Amen? And there's, there's some things that we can talk to about our, our wives and then there's other things that maybe, you know, we can't talk to our wives about, you know, and, and different things like that. Not that we're trying to be secretive or hiding anything from our wives. It's just that, you know, sometimes we need that camaraderie. Amen? And, of course, it's a wonderful place to do that. And I want to encourage brothers, um, yeah, pray about coming next year. And allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. Amen? Because I, I, I guarantee you, you're going to be blessed. Many of the brothers that I talked about, you know, they said, um, man, I almost never made it this weekend. I was actually praying about not coming. And I'm like, I understand. You know, because I was exactly the same way Thursday afternoon. And I got to be honest, confession time, I was like, oh, you mean I got to drive all the way to Waianae, right? And some of you guys from the mainland, you guys are laughing, right? I see Bill over here is laughing. Because it's really not that far, but, you know, we've got a journey, we've got to do all the traffic and all these, these kinds of things. Like, oh, I've got to drive all the way to Waianae. Ah. But when I finally got there, I was like, oh, yes, I'm so glad I came. Amen. So all you brothers that went, you know, raise your hands if you guys had a wonderful time, if you guys were blessed. Yeah, for real. And, again, we're not about trying to hype it out. It's not about that, but it's really an enriching experience. You don't go to men's retreat. You experience men's retreat. And, of course, you make the most of it. Amen. And so, um, well, how does that tie in? Well, I spoke about, um, you know, the story of King David. Now, all of you know King David, right? And it has been prophesied over me um, several times that, you know, oh, Pastor Glenn, he's like a King David. You know, he's like a... Um, you know, uh, leadership, uh, music is a big thing, poetry, because how many of you all know that King David, you know, he wrote the Psalms, not all of it, but he did write Psalms. So he was a songwriter, he was a lyricist, he was a praise and worship leader, but he also served in the military. So, you know, right away, you know, people can see the different parallels in my life with, with King David. And so I'm like, yeah, you know, he's the guy that killed Goliath, Right? So there I am, you know, patting myself on the, on the back. Yeah, you know, killed Goliath and all these kinds of things. And then I began looking deeper into the life of King David. And I began to see the ugly side of him. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 11, it talks about how when he lusted after Bathsheba. Right? And then what did he do? He devised the plan right, to kill, to kill Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, and then what happened? He, um, he, he placed Uriah in like the, the, the heaviest part of the fighting, right? And so Uriah was overwhelmed by the, by the enemy, and eventually Uriah was killed. But that was David's plan altogether. And so that was, uh, he murdered Uriah in a sense, and of course he committed adultery, with Bathsheba, you know, he lusted after him. He was, you know, just, and imagine King David. He had many wives. He had different concubines, all these different things. So that was that side of King David. And, of course, I began to examine within myself. Is there, a, is there you know, that side within me as well? Now, I got to be honest. I'm not a saint. You know, I know you guys like to think that I'm a saint. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? I mean, just being transparent here. Um, and so, of course, I've had my dark side, and I've had to overcome, and by the power of the Holy Spirit and with Jesus, amen, had to overcome some things, certain things, a lot of things. Um, but, you know, that story, going on with that story was that, um, of course, he had a son, and I'll just give you a real brief overview of the story. He had a son named Amnon, another son named Absalom, and a daughter named Tamar. Tamar and Absalom were full sister and brother, but their half-brother Amnon raped Tamar because he lusted after her. Now, that's so, that's so wrong on many different levels, right? Because how can a brother lust after his sister? 
She was a virgin, the scripture tells us. And he raped her and he devised a plan along with their cousin, Jonadab. And it was Jonadab that instigated the whole entire thing. And he said, okay, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, you're going to trick her into going into bed with you. And then you can do whatever you want with her, you can have your way with her. So the, the scripture tells us that he loved her, but really it was lust, brothers and sisters. And of course, you know, lust is a very big thing, especially in this day and age, you know, with the internet and, you know, pornography and different, different things that we see on, in the media and so on and so forth. And so ended up Tamar um, be becoming raped. And according to Deuteronomy, according to the Mosaic law, David knew all this stuff and he, he knew that if a man, let alone his own children, if a man raped another woman, raped a virgin, that man, by law, was required to marry that woman. But he also knew that according to the laws in Leviticus, a brother and sister marrying, that's an abomination. That's a huge no-no. And so David knew this. And for two years, brothers and sisters, two years, King David did not address it. He didn't speak up. And so what happened was he began to build a wall between him and his other son, Absalom. And so that began, I began reflecting about my relationships with my boys. And so fathers, I want to encourage you, you know, examine, if you have sons in here, of course, examine your relationship with your sons. You know, uh, ask God, ask the Holy Spirit to show you if there's anything that you need to address also with your daughters. And so for two years, King David did nothing. Absalom now wanted to make revenge, and so he devised a plan against his brother, and he eventually murdered his brother. Amen. So you can see the ramifications of sometimes doing things, dads, but you can also see the ramifications of sometimes not doing anything. Amen. And so what am I talking about here? How am I bringing this all together? How am I tying this in? And it's because we serve a God who is a God of justice. Amen. And back then, you know, King David, man, just imagine the anguish that he was feeling, you know, just experiencing these kinds of things. And I thought to myself, you know, this is way back in the Old Testament, but how many of you know that you can take that exact same story and bring it into the 21st century? And it matches. You know, so we hear different stories like that. Rape, murder, incest. It hasn't changed. It just looks a little bit different. Amen. So as we talk about acts of kindness, not so random. Right? Of course, it's a play on random acts of kindness. I'm sure you guys recognize that. But living a life of intentionality. Right? And so what I talked about is, you know, becoming a sharp man. Becoming a sharp man. Man, of course, that's an entire different message that I'd love to give someday. But sharp, S, stands for speaking up and speaking out. When you see an injustice in your life, and I don't care who you are, father, husband, mother, sister, daughter, son, if you see an injustice happen, it could be something at work, it could be something at school. How many of you guys know that bullying Right, is a huge thing in the elementary schools, right, Marcella? You hear a lot of uh, bullying, bullying kids and injustice. I remember I used to be bullied. I used to be a bully too. You know, I mean, you think kids are just playing, but it really plays on their, um, their self-esteem and, and different things like that. And that's why a lot of these younger kids, you know, you talk more and more about suicide. Just last week, brothers and sisters, I was at drill. The S word came up. Everybody say the S word. S word, suicide. Yeah. Especially in the army. Once you utter the word suicide, everybody's on you. And so I was, you know, my, my executive officer came up to me and he said, hey, chaplain, you know, uh, so-and-so, uh, private first class so-and-so, can you go see him, please? Because he was thinking about suicide, contemplati contemplating suicide. I go, really? What happened? So I, I went to go look for him. I sat down with him. I said, tell me what's going on. Tell me your story. And basically, he grew up in a, in a broken home. He grew up um, not feeling worthy. He grew up uh, not having any value to him. 
Nobody told him how much you know, they, they loved him or cared about him or anything like that. And so he felt like his life was worthless. He was only 21 years old, brothers and sisters. He hasn't even lived life yet. You know, I saw like, you know what? Give me your number. You know, let's establish a connection. Let's just talk. You know, talk it out. And all that I could do as a chaplain, as a brother in Christ, he, he wasn't even a Christian. He wasn't even a believer. And so I was careful not to say Jesus in a sense, you know, because in the military we, there's different rules and regulations. But he knew, of course, being a chaplain, he knew that I was a Christian. And, and all I wanted to do, my intent, living a life of intentionality, my intent was to just shower love on him. Amen? And so at the end, I could tell his spirits were lifted. And I said, give me your number. And uh, he lives out in Hilo, so actually he flies in to do drills. So, you know, I texted him. I said, hey, man, are you doing good? He goes, yeah, I'm doing a whole lot better, chaplain. Thank you so much. And all I did was just talk with him. All I did was affirm in him how valuable he is, and there's people that care about him. And for whatever sick idea that got into his brain, thinking he was worthless, when all I could see in front of me was a child of God that had been duped by the lies that the world has been telling him. Amen? And that was my weekend, right? But as we go on, brothers and sisters, as children of God, as ambassadors for Christ, walking across the room, walking across the parking lot, walking across the playground, Look at the other brother and sister, and, and, and the Holy Spirit is going to show you how much they're hurting inside. Amen? By just having simple conversations and allowing them to just speak and to share. Amen? Just like you see this picture that I, I put on the screen, Jesus, a lot of you know this story, when he uh, approached the, uh, the prostitute, the adulterous woman, and that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Amen. But before we get into that, right, I've been praying about this situation as well. What is going on in our world? And, um, you know, Pastor Mike, he was the final speaker, and he, he did an amazing, amazing talk, an amazing, amazing message, because Pastor Mike talked about Ezekiel, and he talked about the prophecies. Now, you don't have to be a biblical scholar. You don't have to be a theologian. But his message was, and it's very convincing, brothers and sisters, that according to Ezekiel 36, he, uh, it's a prophecy about Pentecost and about how the Holy Spirit will be poured out into male and female, Jews and Gentiles, old and young, everybody. So Pentecost, that happened. Ezekiel 37, he talked about the establishment of the Israel nation the nation of Israel, and that happened in 1948. Now, if you guys are following the geopolitical arena that's going on, and you can watch Fox News, CNN, and all these kinds of things, we know that geographically, Israel is surrounded by all these Muslim nations. Little, little Israel, the size of New Jersey. But yet, they're indomitable. Nobody can conquer them, because they're a God, that's God's chosen nation. Amen. And then he talked about Ezekiel 38, Gog and Magog, right? And a lot of you guys know some of those things, but some of you guys don't, and that's okay. But there's going to be an enemy to the north. Brothers and sisters, it looks like Russia, Syria, Iran, and all these kinds of things. And Pastor Mike made a convincing claim that prophecy was coming true right before our very eyes. Amen. And so some of these things that as I was praying about Paris, you know, what's going on, he talked about as men, and not only as men, but also as, as women, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we are to, number one, speak up and speak out against any injustice. We also have to be honest, H, with ourselves and humble before our God. We also need to know who our alliances are, okay? who are the power of association in our lives. Who are we hanging out with, right? Rubbing elbows with people, sharpening iron, alliances. R, retreat, 
Sometimes we need to retreat to reflect on our responsibilities. Amen. And of course, P, just like Jesus, whenever he had a full day of ministry, Jesus was God. He was the Son of God. He was God incarnate. But yet Jesus needed to remove himself from being around people and to go and pray and build himself back up again. Amen. So as, as we were reflecting on, on this whole Paris situation, you know, the, I guess the latest count that I, that I saw on the news is 127 dead, 200 wounded or whatever. And then the perpetrators was, of course, you know, Islamic attacks. But then I saw, you know, different articles saying that Barack Obama could not confirm all that, right? Who else is going to do these kinds of atrocious acts, right? But anyway... I, you know, just praying for that situation because Misha asked me a, a question. She goes, Dad, do you think something like that could happen in Hawaii? What do you think? How do you answer that? Right? Could something like that happen in Hawaii? Now, Jesus did say that it was going to get worse before it got better. You know, and I want to say that, uh, you know, we have an eternal home, right? But at the same time, what can we do? We can pray, because do not underestimate the power of prayer. And the message today that I want to give is really reaching out to the unchurched. There is that sense of urgency, but we can also pray that these people, that these Islamic militants, if you will, are not the real enemy, right? Because the enemy is the real enemy. And so we have to pray that God would open their eyes, their blinded eyes, you know, and we may not live an extreme life like them where they're just completely motivated by the religious beliefs, but in a way we are as well. Amen. But it doesn't drive us to kill, but it drives us to love one another. And that's what we're going to be kind of talking about. So there's a lot going on inside my heart. So I apologize if I, it seems like I'm on different tangents and different things like that. Because again, just wonderfully just celebrating our time with the brothers and then you get this news over here, and my daughter Giselle, she's out in Indianapolis because of the Band of America thing. We're so excited because it did wonderfully well. Um, we're so excited for them. And then now Milani High School, marching band, they're going to head over to Disney World. They're going to go to Orlando, so they're going to have a good time. So, of course, as a dad, I'm thinking, Lord, keep them safe over there. Hallelujah. Amen. And then she comes back on the 19th. So we're just praying for them to stay safe, and, uh, and I'm believing for that. Amen. So, Amos 5, and I want to invite you to turn to the book of Amos, if you have your Bibles. Some of you guys are thinking, really? There's a book called Amos in there? <laughs> famous Amos cookies? You know, I don't know, you guys remember famous Amos cookies? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amos 5, verse 21. Of course, Almighty God is speaking through the prophet. And he's saying, I hate, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But, everybody say but. Let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness like a never failing stream. So what are the, well, let me go back. It was so funny because... You know, Teresa and I we were sitting around the table one day and just kind of preparing for this message. And she goes, oh, look, in Amos 5, this is a wonderful passage, right? And so she read it in, um, I think, like in the NIV or the NKJV, the New King James Version. And then she read it in, in the contemporary English version. And I kid you not, it's it like, oh, man, I felt convicted because, you know, the way it read, it said, like, you know, I despise a religious showing or, you know, different, uh, <sighs> what, it just described the contemporary church to a T, right? You know, I don't care about your burnt offerings, you know, away with your praise and worship songs. I will not listen to the music of your guitars and, you know, whatever. And then I thought to myself, wow, it's describing New Hope. 
You know, so I had to really reflect, you know, as, as campus pastors, both Teresa and I, we had to reflect, I hope that's not us. And I'm just being honest, right? But there's two things that God really cares about. Everybody say two things. What are they? Justice and righteousness. That's all he cares about. And of course, you know, God appreciates the songs that we sing, the different events that we have. You know, we, we do different ministries for the Lord. He appreciates all that. But if, it's, if, if the heart is not right, it's no sense, right? It makes no sense. And so God hates all that stuff. Why? Because he sees the heart. And um, yeah, so two things, justice and righteousness. Isaiah 30, verse 18. Elohe mishpat. I think you guys have that in your notes, yeah? Elohe mishpat. Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. And therefore, he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. For all you Hebrew students out there, you can write Elohei Mishpat means God of justice. Misha's laughing because it sounds like her name. <laughs> Mish, Mishpat. The Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. Now, what is he saying? Therefore, the Lord will wait. Why is the Lord going to wait? He's waiting for you to repent. He's waiting for me to repent. He's waiting for all the world to repent. You know, when we think about how, well, you know, God is just a murderer. You know, if you, if you read Old Testament and he's just a bossy kind of guy and, you know, why should we worship him? You know, he's, he killed a lot of people and all these kinds of stuff. Well, if you really look deeper, brothers and sisters, I mean, God really gave people a, a, a chance. Just like the Canaanites. You know, he, 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 he sent different prophets to, to go out and, and, and he wanted them to repent, but, you know, they didn't. They still were, you know, wicked in their ways. And, of course, Israel was influenced by them, so on and so forth. And finally, God said, just wipe them out, right? But he gave them a chance because the Lord uh, says that he will wait and that he may be gracious to people. And so when we think about that, brothers and sisters, the terrorists that are going on, do you think God wants to reach out to them? Yeah. As spooky as, as it sounds or as crazy as it seems, you know, we hear different rulers um, in, the, in the Islamic nation, you know, their children now are coming to Christ. And we can only hope and pray that they'll have an influence in their, in their political, religious, you know, arena and, and influence on their nation and their beliefs. Because now, you know, we're hearing stories more and more where Jesus is appearing in their dreams because that's the only way that he can reach them, right? But he's gracious to everyone and therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on all of us, despite we, what we do. Now, a lot of us, you know, we don't engage in those kinds of act, uh, terrorist ac activities, but still yet, we have to look at our hearts, be honest with yourselves. We have to practice self-transparency. Everybody say self-transparency. And be courageous enough to look within, because a lot of us don't like to look within our own selves, right? Because we don't like what we see. Right? But when we are honest with ourselves and practice self-transparency, we are able to be humble before Almighty God. And that's what God wants because he wants to bless. How can Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, Abba, who wants to provide for everything because he's Jehovah Jireh, provides everything. God is love. He wants to shower his grace and love on all of us. But how can he do that to a disobedient child. As a parent, would you, right, would you reward a disobedient child? No, you would want that child to come to repentance and, and, and then maybe admit to some of the things that they've been doing, right? Amen? For the Lord is a God of justice and all those who wait for him, who trust in him, who believe in him. So no vigilante Christians... No vigilante Christians. I didn't put a note on there. Well, what do you mean by that, Pastor Glenn? No vigilante Christians. Dear friends, Romans 12, 19 says, 
Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. And I'm, I'm glad because Pastor Mike even admitted. Now, Pastor Mike is a very nice guy, very uh, what's, amicable fellow, right? Very nice man. But if you get Pastor Mike mad, boy, don't get him mad. You know, there's a side of him that, you know, he, he like he likes scrap, he likes beef. And so he admitted, he said, you know what? When he first heard the news on TV about Paris, he wanted to go over there and just shoot them all up. And I, in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, that's me too. I'll go, with, I'll, I'll go over with you. You know, if it's just me, Pastor Mike, and Greg, you know, we'll go over to Paris and we'll go shoot all those bad guys up, you know. I'm a chaplain. I'm not supposed to touch a weapon. You know, but hey. Right? But that righteous anger just inside of you, just, oh, I hate those guys. Why did they do that? You know? And then you go back and you kind of just reflect and say, Lord, if only they come to the, the, the knowledge and, and, and understand your love and the truth of what, they're just being blinded by the enemy. Why are they doing these kinds of things? Right? And so we began to just kind of relax about it. But no vigilante Christians. Don't take matters into your own hands. Be, and we need to understand and rest that, that if somebody has wronged you, brothers and sisters, you know, I hear stories about how people just kind of speak death over you. You know, I, I, I understand that there's, there's brothers and sisters that they may have been violated in one way, fo shape, form, or another, molested, raped, you know, I understand it's, it's, those kinds of things exist in our past, right? And maybe somebody has wronged you, right? And we want to make revenge. We want to, we want to take revenge. But understand that the Lord is saying, just rest in me. Peace. Find your rest in me. Find your strength in me. And I will take revenge for you. Can I get an amen? As difficult as that sounds, as difficult as that seems... You know, maybe you were passed up for a promotion at work because somebody stabbed you in the back, you know. Uh, maybe somebody stole something from you. Maybe somebody hit you up, upside the, the head, you know. It's maybe somebody did something to you that just, you couldn't believe what was going on, maybe because you were too young, you know, to, to understand what was going on, and you were violated and different things like that. Amen. No vigilante Christians. You guys understand? Amen, because God will fight our battles for us. Yeah. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all, everybody say all, to come to repentance. You know, maybe even it's the father that you forgot, maybe it's the father that you forget to love, Maybe it's the uncle that wronged you that you hate with a passion. Maybe it's a grandmother. Maybe it's a grandfather that, that was an absentee father or whatever. And because of that, you know, my own story was I had an absentee grandfather. As a result, my father grew up without a father, and he didn't know how to father, and he kind of passed it on to me. But I came into the knowledge of Christ and I learned how to become a father, and so now I'm here before you doing my best, right? Because God is my example. Jesus is my example, amen? And we have to extend grace for some of these people, and I'm praying, and of course, you know, my father did, but all come to repentance. I remember watching my father just cry and just break down before me. What a hard day it was, but it was a wonderful day because he realized, you know, some of the things that he did, you know? And um, I believe it was my sister that, that led him to Christ. Amen. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians. He said, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes, or practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or greedy people, drunkards, 
or are abusive or cheat people. None of these people will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that. Whoa. But you were cleansed. Amen. And this is the good news, brothers and sisters. You were made holy. You were sanctified and set apart for the purposes of God. You were made right with God by calling on the name of who? Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. And so we see for these people that maybe have perhaps been living in this, this, this manner, and some of us, we have been living in the manner, there's a chance for us. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Right? Gospel of go the good news. Amen. Why? Because Jesus said this, and he, was fulf he fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah 61. He said this, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom. Everybody say freedom. freedom. To the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set the free oppressed. To set free the oppressed. Okay, so now we know why Jesus came. And why it's significant for us to place our faith in him. Number one, go ahead and write in your notes. God's justice brings our freedom. And again, brothers and sisters, we don't have to fight the battle because Jesus already won. And God is our avenger. The true avenger. Not Iron Man. Ah. Not Captain America. But God's justice brings our freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from old memories. Freedom from past, verbal abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse. So now as we turn to the Gospel of John chapter 8, this is a very familiar story. Of course, the, um, the adulterous woman. And I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can. But Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman, everybody say a woman, who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher or rabbi, they said to Jesus, this woman was, was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Now, Jesus is not an idiot. Everybody say, Jesus is not an idiot. Jesus knew the Torah. Jesus knew the law because Jesus is the law. He is the word of God, right? But it says here, remember when I said a woman? The law says if a couple has been, or a woman has been caught in the act of adultery, the man and the woman need to be stoned to death, okay? So this is how Jesus knew that they were tricking. Of course, you know, Jesus knew he can read their minds, he can read their hearts. He knew exactly what they were doing. But the, the Pharisees brought over a woman. Well, Jesus is thinking, if indeed she was caught in the act of adultery, where's the man? Okay? So Jesus knew right away that it was a trap. He smelled the trap. Verse 6, they were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Of course, it's a very familiar story. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. Now, how many of you are like me and ask the question, so what did Jesus write in the dust? <laughs> All right. What the heck did he write? <laughs> but this is fascinating, though. The writer of the gospel, and uh, we're presuming it's going to be it's, it's John, but a lot of scholars think it's Luke, and it got mixed into the gospel of John, but we're not going to talk about that this morning. But anyway, so the, they're thinking, well, the writer never put it in. So therefore, you know, as believers, as readers of the word, it's, it's not significant for us. And I, I, I believe that too, because I believe that if, uh, if it truly was important, then it would have been in the Bible. However, check this out. Why, why do you think Jesus did that? You know, and, and, and scholars think that, you know, if, if Jesus was here today, 
instead of stooping down to kind of scribble, you know, and it's kind of like, I can think of like maybe a, a child who's bored, right? And you give them a crayon and a piece of paper, and so they're, they're doodling over there. And, and some scholars think maybe that's how Jesus was, because he was like, oh, I know you guys. You guys are trying to trap me. You know, you guys, are, you, you, you can't fool me, and so I'm bored. You know, yeah, whatever. You know, just say whatever you guys want to say, and I'll, I'll, I'll get you. Right? So he's bored. He's just kind of sitting down and just kind of writing down and doodling. Some scholars believe that. But this is what Jeremiah tells us. Jeremiah says, O Yahweh, the immerser, baptizer of Israel, all those who leave your way shall be put to shame publicly, embarrassed. Those who turn aside from my ways will have their names written in the dust and blotted out. For they have departed from Yahweh, the fountain of Maim Chaim, the waters of life. Okay? So now there's other scholars are thinking, no, Jesus was fulfilling that prophecy. Isn't that awesome? So Jesus was probably, maybe, imagine now, maybe Jesus was writing the names of the Pharisees that were accusing her. Perhaps some of these Pharisees, because they were rich men, or maybe her clientele. And Jesus got them. He wrote their names on the ground. And so when the Pharisees came over to him and saw what he was writing, he's like, oh man, he read my mail. Drop the stone and walk away. Right? Like a dog, be- you know, like a you know, tail between his legs. So anyway, that's what I land on. That's what I believe in. You know, Jesus was into fulfilling all these prophecies. I mean, it's very convincing, right? So number two, let Christ's freedom liberate you from the world's condemnation. The world's condemnation. When the Pharisees try to come at you, accuse you of certain things, right? Jesus is there to back you up. Let Christ's freedom liberate you from the world's condemnation. Moving on with the story, verse 9. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, right? In other words, they were feeling guilty. Went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said, and Jesus said, the magic words, right? Neither do I go and sin no more. Hallelujah. And so brothers, right, a lot of us, you know, go through the, the, the clean series, right? And that's a, definitely a word that we can tell to ourselves. Yeah? Go and sin no more. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Number three, write in your notes. Let Christ's freedom inspire right living. Hallelujah. And when I saw this picture, I just had to go with the doggy theme. You know, just jumping for joy and smiling. <laughs> right? And that's exactly how we feel. Amen. Let Christ free. Oh, you can run and jump and just have fun, you know. You don't got to be weighed down by all these burdens again. Hallelujah. Let Christ's freedom inspire right living. Right? And I want to share with you, and I was going to show a video, but, you know, just um, maybe next time I'll show the video. But this is a wonderful, wonderful story, um, one that we experienced earlier this year. And this is the Seed Restaurant. Some of you guys are familiar with the Seed Restaurant. This is out in uh, Wailai, out in Wailai. And uh, Pastor Mike um, knows the pastor there, Jordan Singh. And um, he basically he basically set up a restaurant, and it's for people that kind of um, going through rehabilitation, you know, from their past. And a lot of them were um, ex-convicts, uh, drug abusers, prostitution, and all these kinds of things. And so very familiar to, like, Ho'ola Napua, right? And so it's, it's a place where they can come and they can reintegrate back into society again. And so um, we took a picture with that. You see that one lady? 
Not Pastor Lori. You guys know Pastor Lori, yeah? Not her. The other one, right? The other one. She says, like, yeah, like S-E on her, on her, uh, on her shirt. But anyway, that, that lady, her name is Mary. And she's referred to affectionately as Miracle Mary. And I tell you what, brothers and sisters, she has an amazing, amazing testimony. Like she should have been dead like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand times. And she was just telling a story about how um, she used to live in New York City on 42nd Street. Some of you guys are, you know, 42nd Street. That's like right in the heart of New York City. And of course, this was back in the 70s and the 80s. And of course, you know, you can imagine, you know, disco going on, right? Disco, right? John Travolta, Saturday Night Fever, and all these kinds of things. Prostitution, drugs. She had a pimp on many, many occasions. She was beaten. She was stabbed. She was shot. She was strangled. She was drugged up. She, countless clients. She, she was a prostitute ever since the age of, I want to say, 14. The age of 14. So she moved from state to state, right? Prostituting herself for over, I want to say 35 years is what she said, or something like that. She came to Hawaii. She started working the streets in Waikiki. And you know what she said? Um, when she was walking the streets of Waikiki one night, of course, you know, all the Japanese you know, clients over there, so she's very fluent in Japanese as well. And so she said, there's this one Japanese lady, small, demure, small Japanese lady would just kind of follow her around. Right? And, and would want to minister to her and reach out to her. But she did that consistently. And, it, and Mary would be like, oh, there's those church people again. Right? And she would run away, right? But that little old lady would keep coming back, reaching out to her. Right? Persistently, consistently reaching out to her. And all of a sudden, she's like, and in, in, in deep in her heart, deep, deep, deep inside her heart, she knew that what she was doing and the life that she was living was wrong. She knew that what she was doing and what she was, how she was living was not for her. But for whatever reason, she just had been mined, her mind had just been manipulated, right? And talk to Ho'olonapua, our, our, our point of contact here, Carl and Maureen, right? And they can attest to those kinds of things where you're just manipulated and, and brainwashed, right? So she had been that, but she knew deep down inside that Christ was calling out to her. She could hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit reaching out to her. And it took a little Japanese demure lady with a big spirit, right? Little lady, big spirit, reaching out to her and finally saying yes to, yes to the Lord. So, you know, Seed Restaurant hired her to help her, you know, again, reintegrate back into society. And uh, she talks about a wonderful testimony on YouTube. Um, she talks about how very, she was socially handicapped. She couldn't speak with anyone unless she was drugged up, of course, right? You're in that state. Um, and it took her a while, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, now she's like a chatterbox, man. And I tell you what, we had a great time just sitting down with her, talking with her, testifying, preaching. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if she gets up on stage and you know, becomes a, a, a pastor of some sort. I don't know. She's just powerful and amazing. And the Lord works wonders through her. Amen. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that there's people like her in our midst, right? People like her in our midst. And uh, again, Ho'olonapua is something we want to highlight. Just a tremendous, tremendous ministry. Galatians 5.13, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. In other words, it's not a ticket, right? Just because you say yes to Jesus, now, you're, now it's a ticket for you to, to live sinfully, right? Now, according to Philippians, now we have to work out our faith, not work for our faith because Jesus won that, but we have to work out our faith. Amen. So instead, everybody say instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. And that's exactly what Miracle Mary is doing right now. She's, she's going out there to Waikiki and she's reaching out to the other prostitutes there and say, hey, you know what? I used to be where you are. You can live differently. You know, and she's actively going out there and reaching out to those, those prostitutes, both male and female, really. Amen. 
Number four, write in your notes, let Christ's freedom move you to liberate others. Move you to liberate others. You might be suffering from a very low self-esteem. You might feel you're inadequate in certain areas. Allow the Lord to fill you back up again and listen to the voice of the Lord, amen? Some of you are, I know for me, not understanding my purpose in life, not understanding value, self-worth, right? And those were my chains, that was my bondage. But let Christ's freedom move you to liberate others. And just like that one young soldier that I talked about, you know, just going out there and just having a conversation with him, simple conversation and making that connection and allowing him to express himself. And that's, that's all sometimes people need, just to be heard, just to be affirmed. And, um, you know, prayerfully as we go on, I can build a, a very good relationship with him. And, you know, he's talking about starting his own, you know, yard cleaning business and, you know, giving him a vision for his life, you know, so on and so forth, and that, that he can live beyond what he just sees. And as brothers and sisters, right, we come in and we offer a different perspective, God's perspective. Hallelujah. And so I want to read this wonderful, wonderful testimony as we close. You know this individual. I'm not going to mention the name. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful individual. As uh, we get the piano up here. Thanks, Micah. And then we're going to go into a time of prayer. Hallelujah. Remember a while ago, right, when I said, okay, write your testimonies in 100 words or less. Clearly, this person didn't do it. (laughs) But that's okay. That's okay. You know, she was able to verbally um, express how she was feeling inside and just, you know, experiencing a lot, of, a lot of things in her past and the way that she was o- be able to overcome. And now I believe, you know, Christ is going to use this testimony very powerfully. Amen. Amen. She said, growing up with God in my life was everything spoken to me by my grandparents. They told me that whenever I'm in trouble, sad, or hurt to just call on him and that he will be by my side to protect me. Until I started getting beaten, molested, and raped at a young age. I was also in a marriage that was forced on me. I was verbally and physically abused and my spouse abused drugs. I didn't want my children growing up in that environment. So I got a divorce and my family was really mean about it. And so was his. I remember hearing my mother say, if I knew you were a girl, I would have gotten rid of you. I felt like God wasn't there for me. I was angry at God, yelling at him, dropping to my knees and crying for someone to come and save me, someone to love me, looking for love in all the wrong places, saying, Lord, why did you even bring me into this world? Why don't you just take me away and make everyone happy with me being gone? Asking the Lord, why am I here? What is my purpose? Right? And again, brothers and sisters, she is one of us. Waiting for an answer from him, but I heard nothing. In the meantime, I put up a wall to block and protect myself from everyone, even from him. I felt like I was in hell, nowhere to go, nowhere to turn away. My life was falling apart. But I had to be strong because I had my children, and being a single mom, I didn't want my children to grow up that way. I got remarried, and the cycle began all over again with the physical abuse, the mental abuse, and the drugs. It took my cousin to nag me to come to church. I said to myself, What do I have to lose? It felt like I was already hitting rock bottom. I didn't have my grandparents anymore. So I said to God, if anyone can help me, I'm going to trust in you again. This time, I'm going to fight 
with everything I have and with you. God standing by my side. I'm going to fight for my marriage, my children, and everything that the enemy took away from me. Because I am a woman of God and nothing or anyone will ever take that away from me because greater is he that lives in me than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. That's 1 John 4.4. 4. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. I'm going to keep on being obedient. I'm going to keep on fighting to the last breath I take for my God. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But the one thing that I do want to say is that God doesn't want us to fight anymore. He wants us to just rest in Him because Jesus does the fighting for us. Amen. Jesus won the victory for us. And Jesus just wants us to just rest and just experience his shalom peace. And so that's what we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Brothers and sisters, if any of you have been violated some way, if any of you have been wronged in any way, if any of you have experienced certain things that maybe the Lord is, is bringing out and he wants you to address, if that's you in any way, just go ahead and wave your hand. Awesome. Praise the Lord. If any of you have maybe forgotten, have forgotten your identity, maybe some of us need a reminder that we are a child of God and that we are accepted with loving arms into the family of God. If you have forgotten that, brothers and sisters, just go ahead and raise your hands. Hallelujah. Then if everyone here, beyond a shadow of a doubt, can honestly say that Jesus Christ, you are my Lord and Savior, if you can honestly say that, go ahead and raise your hands. Everybody here, hallelujah. Amen, amen. So what I want to do right now, brothers and sisters, is sing a song. Because as we saw in the book of Amos, right, God's justice, God's righteousness is flowing like a river in our midst. And I just want to, when I found out, you know, what the message was going to be about, and when we read Amos, I was like, oh, I love that. You know, because there was a song that I, learned years ago where it says, you know, let justice roll like a river. But then I began singing this song. This is one of the songs that I, I learned, you know, many, many years ago. And uh, I want to share it with you. And so, of course, I want to teach it to you and I want you guys to sing along with me. Okay. I don't want to sing alone. So sing with me. There's a mighty river. There's a mighty river flowing. A mighty river flowing in this place. Try that, church. Hallelujah. And there's a mighty river flowing. A mighty river flowing in this place. Sing that again. There's a mighty river flowing, a mighty river flowing in this place. There's a mighty river flowing, a mighty river flowing in this place. God's justice is righteousness. And, and it's full of passion, full of power, full of glory. It's full of grace. For that. And, and it's full of passion, 
full of power, full of glory. It's full of praise. Let's try the love of God. The love of God is flowing. The love of God is flowing through this place. Hallelujah. The love of God is flowing. The love of God is flowing through this place. So receive his love, church. Receive his love, the love of God. The love of God is flowing. The love of God is flowing through this place. One more time. The love of God is flowing. The love of God is flowing through this place. And it's full of passion. And then it's full of passion, full of power, full of glory. It's full of grace, full of passion. And then it's full of passion, full of power, full of glory. It's full of grace. Can I invite everybody to stand, please, as we sing the last verse, the arms of God. The arms of God are open. The arms of God are open to embrace. Hallelujah. The arms of God are open. The arms of God are open to embrace. The arms of God. The arms of God are open. The arms of God are open to embrace. Let's sing that one more time. The arms of God are open. The arms of God are open to embrace. And it's full of passion. And then it's full of passion, full of power full of glory it's full of grace pastor teresa and it's full of passion full of power full of glory it's full of grace let's sing about his river his mighty river flowing a mighty river flowing in this place. There's a mighty river flowing, a mighty river flowing in this place. Hallelujah. Sorry about that. I wasn't sure what he wanted me to do. We don't plan anything. Normally the Holy Spirit just tells me, I'm like, I'm getting nothing here, Lord. <laughs> like, what am I supposed to do? Um, but I, he wants me to close this out. And I guess uh, he wants me to close this out because he knows how uh, passionate I am about the God of justice. And maybe you're like me and you're a justice person. And you think in your former life you should have been a part of the Justice League. Uh, <laughs> and over the course of the years, I really had to learn uh, the mercy of God. Because sometimes when we have God's justice, we want to come across heavy-handed. And I had to learn that it's not my justice. Justice belongs to the Lord. And our job is to walk in love and compassion and mercy and kindness, just as he does. And trust that the God of justice will make all things that are wrong right. Can I get an amen? And so whatever it is you're facing in your life, if you're facing injustice somewhere, I pray that your faith would be um, heightened to know that the God of justice will prevail, will prevail and the light of Christ will shine in that dark place. And I want to encourage you that if you're passionate about justice, get involved. The Lord needs more people who have his heart for justice. Amen? Um, so with every eye closed and every head bowed, 
I know that Pastor Glenn asked if you know Jesus, raise your hand. But we definitely want to give you an opportunity if you don't know Jesus to raise your hand. So with every eye closed and every head bowed, if you've never put in your faith and your trust in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, where you entered into a personal relationship with him, would you raise your hand? We want to pray for you. Maybe you're here today and you, you know the Lord, you've given your heart to the Lord, but you haven't been walking with him and you kind of fell away, you backslid into your old way, old way of living and you want to rededicate your life. If that's you here this morning, would you raise your hand? We want to pray for you as well. I see you, sister. The good news is because we serve a God that's a just God, he knew that we would need a way back to him every time we fell short. And he knew that we could come before the cross at Calvary and accept the free gift of grace and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter how many times we fall, we always know we can come back to him. If we just humble ourselves and confess our sins before him, he will be faithful to forgive them. So would everybody just repeat this prayer after me? Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of grace. Thank you for the gift of forgiveness. Through your son, Jesus Christ, I humbly come before you. I confess my sins to you, O Lord. I repent of those sins and turn away from my wrong living and turn to you. I surrender now once again to live for you and to have you be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would you give the Lord a hand clap for those people who came back to Christ today? So I want to encourage you. There's a lot of um, different opportunities to get involved with the ministry of God here in the community. Stick around in the back um, after church and just get to know us and let us get to know you. Uh, if you made some kind of decision for God this morning or the message touched you in any way, could you let us know about it on the communication card? We'd love to celebrate with you. And to those watching online, thank you for joining us. It is such a pleasure to have you folks joining our Ohana. And although we've not met you yet, we pray that the Spirit of God would make us one as the family of God. Um, the only way the Spirit of God can do. So we hope to see you again next week. We went over time, so we're not going to sing the benediction. So if we can get the sound tech to just throw on some house music, is that possible, Vance? I'm going to say aloha and God bless you until we see you next week. And we continue in our series of acts of kindness, not so random. Aloha. Aloha.